the bottom of the crate, he pulled out a large black mace with a flanged head. Frederick mapped a knuckle against the mace. You can break swords with this. You can split mail and batter in helms. And you won't do it the slightest bit of harm, no matter what you hit. It's a club, Eragon protested. A metal club. What of it? With your strength, you can swing it as if it were light as a reed. You'll be a terror on the battlefield with this, you will. Aragon shook his head. No. Smashing things isn't how I prefer to fight. Besides, I've never been able to kill Durza by stabbing him through the heart. If I'd been carrying a mace instead of a sword. Then I have only one more suggestion. Unless you insist upon a traditional blade. From another part of the pavilion, Frederick brought Aragon a weapon he identified as a falchion. It was a sword, but not a type of sword Aragon was accustomed to, although he had seen them among the Vardom before. The falchion had a polished, disc-shaped pommel, bright as a silver coin. A short grip made of wood covered with black leather, a curved crossguard carved with a line of dwarf runes, and a single edge blade that was as long as his outstretched arm and had a thin form on either side, close to the spine. The falchion was straight until about six inches from the end, where the back of the blade flared upward in a small peak, before gently curving down to the needle-sharp tip. This widening of the blade reduced the likelihood that the point would bend or snap when driven through armor, and lent the end of the falchion a fang-like appearance. Unlike the double-edged sword, the falchion was made to be held with a blade and crossguard perpendicular to the ground. The most curious aspect of the falchion though, was the bottom half inch of the blade, including the edge, which was pearly grey and substantially darker than the mirror-smooth steel above. The boundary between the two areas was wavy, like a silk scarf rippling in the wind. Aragon pointed at the grey band. I've not seen that before. What is it? The Thrickens Dark, said Frederick. The dwarves invented it. They temper the edge and the spine separately. With the edge, they make hard. Harder than we dare with the whole of our blades. The middle of the blade and the spine, they are neat, so that the back of the falchion is softer than the edge, soft enough to bend and flex and survive the stress of battle without fracturing like a frost-ridden file. Do the dwarves treat all their blades thusly? Frederick shook his head. Only their single-edged swords and the finest of their double-edged swords. He hesitated, and uncertainty crept into his gaze. You understand why I chose this for you, Shadeslayer, yes? Aragon understood. With the blade of the falchion at right angles to the ground, unless he deliberately tilted his wrist, any blows he caught on the sword would strike the flat of the blade, saving the edge for attacks of his own. Wielding the falchion would require only a small adjustment to his fighting style. Striding out of the pavilion, he assumed a ready position with the falchion. Swinging it over his head, he brought it down upon the head of an imaginary foe, then twisted and lunged, beat aside an invisible spear, sprang six yards to his left, and, in a brilliant but impractical move, spun the blade behind his back, passing it from one hand to the next as he did so. His breathing and heartbeat calm as ever, he returned to where Frederick and Blodgarn were waiting. The speed and balance of the falchion had impressed Aragorn. It was not the equal of Zarok, but it was still a superb sword. You chose well, he said. Frederick detected a reticence in his bearing, however, for he said, And yet you are not entirely pleased, Shadeslayer? Aragorn twirled the falchion in a circle, then grimaced. I just wish it didn't look so much like a big skinny knife. I feel rather ridiculous with it. Oh, pay no heed if your enemies laugh. They'll not be able to once you lop off their heads. Amused, Aragorn nodded. I'll take it. One moment then, said Frederick, and disappeared into the pavilion, returning with a black leather scabbard decorated with silver scrollwork. He handed the scabbard to Aragorn and asked, Did you 
Did you ever learn how to sharpen a sword, Shakespeare? You wouldn't have had need with Zarok, would you? No. Aragorn admitted. But I am a fair hand with a whetstone. I can hone a knife until it is so keen it will cut a thread draped over it. Besides, I can always throw out the edge with magic if I have to. Frederick groaned and slapped his thighs, knocking loose a dozen or so hairs from his oxide leggings. No, no. A razor-thin edge is just what you don't want on a sword. The bevel has to be thick, thick and strong. A warrior has to be able to maintain his equipment properly, and that includes knowing how to sharpen his sword. Frederick insisted then procuring a new whetstone for Aragorn, and showing him exactly how to put a battle-ready edge on the falchion, while they sat in the dirt beside the pavilion. Once he was satisfied that Aragorn could grind an entirely new edge on the sword, he said, You can fight with rusty armor, you can fight with a dented helmet, but if you want to see the sun rise again, never fight with a dull sword. If you've just survived a battle and you're tired as a man who has climbed one of the Beor Mountains and your sword isn't sharp as it is now, it doesn't matter how you feel. You plunk yourself down the first chance you get and pull out your whetstone and strop. Just as you would see to your horse or to Sephira before you attend to your own needs, so too you should care for your sword before yourself. Because without it, you're no more than helpless prey for your enemies. They'd been sitting out in the late afternoon sun for over an hour, by the time the weapon master finally finished his instructions. As he did, a cool shadow slid over them, and Sephira landed close by. You waited, said Aragorn. You deliberately waited. You could have rescued me ages ago, but instead you left me here to listen to Frederick go on about water stones, oil stones, and whether linseed oil is better than rendered fat for protecting metal from water. And is it? Really? It's just not a smelly. But that's irrelevant. Why did you leave me to this doom? One of her thick eyelids. Frederick and bidding him farewell, and agreeing upon a meeting place with Blodgar, Aragorn fastened the falchion to the belt of Beelok the Wise, and clambered onto Sephira's back. He whooped, and she roared as she raised her wings, and surged up into the sky. Giddy, Aragorn clung to the spike in front of him, and watched the people and tents below dwindle away into flat, miniature versions of themselves. From above, the camp was a grid of great triangular peaks, the eastern faces of which were deep in shadow, giving the whole region a checkered appearance. The fortifications that encircled the camp bristled like a hedgehog, the white tips of the distant poles bright in the slanted sunlight. King Orin's cavalry was a mass of milling dots in the northwestern quadrant of the camp. To the east was the Urgul's camp, low and dark on the rolling plain. They soared higher. The cold, pure air stung Aragorn's cheeks and burned in his lungs. He took only shallow breaths. Beside them floated a thick column of clouds looking as solid as whipped cream. Sephira spiraled around it, her ragged shadow racing across the bloom. A lone scrap of moisture struck Aragorn, blinding him for a few seconds and filling his nose and mouth with frigid droplets. He gasped and wiped his face. They rose above the clouds. A red eagle screeched at them as it flew past. Zephira's flapping became labored, and Aragorn began to feel lightheaded. Stilling her wings, Zephira glided from one thermal to the next, maintaining her altitude, but ascending no farther. Aragorn looked down. They were so high 
height had ceased to matter, and things on the ground no longer seemed real. The Varden's camp was an irregularly shaped playing board covered with tiny grey and black rectangles. The Jeep River was a silver rope fringed with green tassels. To the south, the sulfurous clouds rising from the burning plains formed a range of glowing orange mountains, home to shadowy monsters that flickered in and out of existence. Aragon quickly averted his gaze. For perhaps half an hour, he and Sephira drifted with the wind, relaxing in the silent comfort of each other's company. An enormous spell served to insulate Aragon from the chill. At last, they were alone together. Alone as they had been in Palkar Valley before the Empire had intruded upon their life. Sephira was the first to speak. We are the rulers of the sky. Here at the ceiling of the world. Aragon reached up, as if from where he sat he could brush the stars. Back to the left, Sephira caught a gust of warmer air from below. Then they were on again. Harry, Ultra, and Katrina tomorrow. What a strange thought that is. Roran should marry, and strange I should be the one to perform the ceremony. Roran married. Thinking about it makes me feel older. Even we, who were boys but a short while ago, cannot escape the inexorable progress of time. So the generations pass. And soon it will be our turn to send our children out into the land to do the work that needs to be done. But not unless we can survive the next few months. Aye, there is that. Sephira wobbled as turbulence buffeted them. Then she looked back at him and asked, Ready? Go! Tilting forward, she pulled her wings close against her sides and plummeted toward the ground faster than a speeding arrow. Aragon laughed as the sensation of weightlessness overtook him. He tightened his legs around Sephira to keep himself from drifting away from her, then, overtaken by a surge of recklessness, released his grip and held his hands over his head. The disc of land below spun like a wheel as Sephira walked through the air. Slowing the men, stopping her rotation, she rolled to the right until she was falling upside down. Sephira! cried Aragon and pounded her shoulder. Streaming from her nostril, she righted herself and again pointed herself at the fast approaching ground. Aragorn's ears were popped, and he worked his jaw as the pressure increased. Less than a thousand feet above the Varden's camp, and only a few seconds from crashing into the tents and excavating a large and bloody crater, Sephira allowed the wind to catch her wings. The subsequent jolt threw Aragorn forward and the spike he had been holding nearly stabbed him in the eye. With three powerful flaps, Sephira brought them to a complete halt. Locking her wings outstretched, she then began to gently circle downward. Now that was fun! Explained Erica. There is no more exciting sport than dying. <laughs> For if you lose, you die. Ah, oh, but I have complete confidence in your abilities. You would never run us into the ground. Her pleasure at his compliment radiated from her. Angling toward his tent, she shook her head, jostling him, and said, I ought to be accustomed to it by now, but every time I come out of a dive like that, it makes my chest and wing arms so sore. The next morning I can barely move. He patted her. Well, you shouldn't have to fly tomorrow. The wedding is our only obligation, and you can walk to it. She grunted, and landed amid a billow of dust, knocking over an empty tent with her tail in the process. Dismounting, Aragorn left her grooming herself, with six of the elves standing nearby. And with the other six, he trotted through the camp until he located the healer, Gertrude. From her, he learned the marriage rites he would need the following day, and he practiced them with her, that he might avoid an embarrassing blunder when the moment arrived. Then Aragorn returned to his tent and washed his face and changed his clothes, 
before going with Sephira to dine with King Orin and his entourage as promised. Late that night, when the feast was finally over, Aragorn and Sephira were back to his tent, gazing at the stars and talking about what had been and what yet might be. And they were happy when they arrived at their destination. Aragorn paused and looked up at Sephira, and his heart was so full of love, he thought it might stop beating. Good night, Sephira. Good night, little one. Unexpected guests. The next morning, Aragorn went behind his tent, removed his heavy outer clothes, and began to glide through the poses of the second level of the Rengar. A series of exercises the elves had invented. Soon his initial chill vanished. He began to pant from the effort and sweat coated his limbs, which made it difficult for him to keep hold of his feet or his hands, but contorted into a position that felt as if it were going to tear the muscles from his bones. An hour later, he finished the red card. Drying his palms on the corner of his tent, he drew the falchion and practiced his swordsmanship for another 30 minutes. He would have preferred to continue familiarizing himself with the sword for the rest of the day, for he knew his life might depend upon his skill with it. But Roran's wedding was fast approaching, and the villagers could use all the help they could get if they were to complete the preparations in time. Refreshed, Aragorn bathed in cold water and dressed. And then he and Sephira walked to where Elaine was overseeing the cooking of Oren and Katrina's wedding feast. Malgar and his companions followed a dozen or so yards behind, slipping between the tents with stealthy ease. Ah, oh, good, Aragorn, Elaine said. I had hoped you would come. She stood with both her hands pressed into the small of her back to relieve the weight of her pregnancy. Pointing with her chin past a row of spits and cauldrons suspended over a bed of coals, past a clump of men butchering a hog, past three makeshift ovens built of mud and stone, and past a pile of cakes, a pile of planks set on stumps that six women were using as a counter. She said, There are still twenty loaves of bread dough that have to be needed. Will you see to it, please? Then she frowned at the calluses on his knuckles. And try not to get those in the dough, won't you? The six women standing at the planks, which included Felder and Bridget, fell silent when Aragorn took his place among them. His few attempts to restart the conversation failed. But after a while, when he had given up on putting them at ease, and was concentrating on his needing, they resumed talking of their own accord. They spoke about Roran and Katrina, and how lucky the two of them were and of the villagers' life in the camp, and of their journey there. And then, without preamble, Felder looked over at Aragorn and said, Your dough looks a little sticky. Shouldn't you have some flour? Aragorn checked the consistency. You're right. Thank you. Felder smiled, and after that the women included him in their conversation. While Aragorn worked with the dough, Sephira lay basking on a nearby patch of grass. The children from Carvajal played on and around her. Laughing shrieks punctuated the deeper thrum of the adults' voices. When a pair of mangy dogs started barking at Sephira, she lifted her head off the ground and growled at them. They ran away, yipping. Everyone in the clearing was someone Aragorn had known while growing up. Horst and Fisk were on the other side of the spits, constructing tables for the feast. Kisselt was wiping the hog's blood off his forearms. Albrecht, Balder, Mandel, and several other of the younger men were carrying poles wound with ribbons toward the hill where Roran and Katrina wished to be married. The tavern keeper Morn was off mixing the wedding drink with his wife Tara holding three flagons and a cask of a few hundred feet away, Roran was shouting something at a mule driver who was attempting to run his charges through the clearing. Roaring Gilman and the boy Nolfa for a minute, watching. A loud curse, Roran grabbed the lead mule harness and struggled to turn the animals round. The sight amused Eragon. He had never known Roran to get so flustered, nor to be so short-tempered. 
the mighty warrior this nervous series contest, observed Dissault, one of the six women next to Aragorn. The group laughed. Perhaps, Burgess said, stirring water into flour. He is worried his sword may bend in the battle. Chaos of merriment swept the women. Aragorn's cheeks flushed. He kept his gaze fixed on the dough in front of him and increased the speed of his leading. Bawdy jokes were common at weddings, and he had enjoyed his share before. But hearing them directed at his cousin disconcerted him. The people who would not be able to attend the wedding were as much on Aragon's mind as those who could. He thought of Bird, Quimby, Pa, Ida, Young Elmond, Kelby, and the others who had died because of the Empire of the War. And wished his uncle was still alive to see his only son acclaimed a hero by the villagers of the part of the lake. And to see him take Katrina's hand and finally become a man in full. Closing his eyes, Aragon turned his face toward the noonday sun and smiled up at the sky, content. The weather was pleasant. The aroma of yeast, flour, roasting meat, Freshly poured wine, boiling soups, sweet pastries, and melted candies suffused the clearing. His friends and family were gathered around him for celebration and not for mourning. And for the moment, he was safe, and Sophia was safe. This is how life ought to be. A single horn rang out across the land, unnaturally loud. Then again, and again. Everyone froze, uncertain what the three notes signified. For a brief interval, the entire camp was silent except for the animals. Then the barbers' war drums began to beat. Chaos erupted. Mothers ran for their children and cooks dampened their fires, while the rest of the men and women scrambled after their weapons. Erdogan sprinted towards Sephira, even as she surged to her feet. Reaching out with his mind, he found Modgar, and once the elf lowered his defenses somewhat, he said, Meet us at the north entrance. Be here and obey, Shadeslayer. Aragorn flung himself onto Sephira. The instant he got a leg over her neck, she jumped four rows of tents, landed, and then jumped a second time, her wings half furled, not flying, but rather bounding through the camp like a mountain cat crossing a fast-flowing river. The impact of each landing jarred Aragorn's teeth and spine and threatened to knock him off his perch. As they rose and fell, frightened warriors dodging out of their path, Aragorn contacted Triana and the other members of Dufranga Gata, identifying the location of each spellcaster and organizing them for battle. Someone who was not of Dufranga Gata touched his thoughts. He recoiled, slamming walls up around his consciousness before he realized that it was Angela the herbalist and allowed the contact. She said, I am with Masuada and Elva. Masuada wants you and Sephira to meet her at the north entrance as soon as we can. Yes, yes, we're on our way. What of Elva? Does she sense anything? Pain, great pain. Yours, the Vardens, the others. I'm sorry, she's not very coherent right now. It's too much for her to cock with. I'm going to put her to sleep until the violence is at an end. Angela severed the connection. Like a carpenter, laying out and examining his tools before beginning a new project, Aragorn reviewed the wards he had placed around himself, Sephira, Nasawada, Arya, and Roran. They all seemed to be in order. Sephira slid to a stop in his tent, following the packed earth with her talons. He leaped off her back, gnawing as he struck the ground. Bouncing upright, he dashed inside, undoing his sword belt as he went. He dropped the belt and the attached falchion into the dirt, and scrambling under his cot, retrieved his armor. The cold, heavy rings of the male hauberk slid over his head, and settled on his shoulders with a sound like falling coins. He tied on his army cap, placed the coif over it, and then jammed his head into his helm. Snatching up the belt, he refastened it around his waist. With his greaves and his braces in his left hand, he hooked his little finger through the arm strap of his shield, grabbed Sephira's heavy saddle with his right hand, and burst out of the tent. Releasing his armor in a noisy clatter, he threw the saddle onto the mound of Sephira's shoulders and climbed after it. In his haste and excitement and his apprehension, 
He had trouble buckling the straps. Safira shifted her stance. Hurry! You're taking too long! Yes, I'm moving as fast as I can! It doesn't help me to have blasted big! She growled. The camp swarmed with activity. Men and dwarves streaming in jangling rivers toward the north, rushing to answer the summons of the war drums. Aragon collected his abandoned armor off the ground, mounted Saphira, and settled into the saddle. With a flash of downswept wings and jaunt acceleration, a blast of swirling air, and the bitter complaint of bracers scraping against shield, Saphira took to the air. While they sped toward the northern edge of the camp, Aragon strapped the greaves to his shins, holding himself on Saphira merely with the strength of his legs. The bracers he wedged between his belly and the front of the saddle. The shield he hung from a neck spike. When the greaves were secure, he slid his legs through the row of leather loops on either side of the saddle, then tightened the slip knot on each loop. Aragon's hand brushed against the belt of bellot the wise. He groaned. Fear it, Helmdrand. Ah! I should have stored some energy in it. We'll be fine, said Safira. He was just fitting on the braces when Safira arched her wings, cupping the air with the translucent membranes, and reared, stalling to a standstill as she alighted upon the crest of one of the embankments that ringed the camp. Asawada was already there, sitting upon her massive charger battle storm. Beside her was Jormunda, also mounted, Arya, on foot, and the current watch of the Nighthawks led by Kagra, one of the Urgals Aragon had met on the burning plains. Grodgarth and the other elves emerged from the forest of tents behind them, and stationed themselves close to Aragon and Sophia. From a different part of the camp galloped King Orin and his retinue, reining in their prancing steeds as they drew near as the Close upon their heels came Nahi, chief of the dwarves and three of his warriors, the group of them riding ponies clad with leather and mail armor. Now Garjvar ran out of the fields to the east, the culls thudding footsteps preceding his arrival by several seconds. Asawada shouted an order, and the guards at the north entrance pulled aside the crude wooden gate to allow Garjvar inside the camp. On the north the cull probably could have knocked open the gate to the dump. Scaling the embankment with four inhumanly long strides. The horses shied away from the gigantic gurgle. Look! Asawada pointed. Aragon was already studying their enemies. Roughly two miles away, five sleek boats, black as pitch, <coughs> had landed upon the near bank of the Jeep River. From the boats, there issued a swarm of men, garbed in the livery of Galbatorix's army. The host glittered like wind-whipped water under a summer sun. The swords, spears, shields, helmets, and mail ringlets caught the reflected light. Arya shaded her eyes with a hand and squinted at the soldiers. The number between 270 and 300. Why so few? Wondered Jormunder. King Orin scowled. Albatorix cannot be mad enough to believe he can destroy us with such a paltry force. Orin pulled off his helm, which was in the shape of a crown, and dabbed his brow with the corner of his tunic. We could obliterate that entire group and not lose a man. Maybe, said Nasawada. Maybe not. Gnawing on the words, Garjvar added, the Dragon King is a false tongued traitor, a rogue ram, but his mind is not feeble. He is coming like a blood hungry weasel. The soldiers assembled themselves in orderly ranks and then began marching toward the ladder. A messenger boy ran up to Nasawada. She bent in her saddle to listen, then dismissed him. Now, Garchwag, your people are safe within our camp. They are gathered near the east gate, ready for you to lead them. Garjvark grunted, but remained where he was. Looking back at the approaching soldiers, Asavada said, I can think of no reason to engage them in the open. We can pick them off with archers once they are within range. And when they reach our breastwork, 
They will break themselves against the trenches and the staves. Not a single one will escape alive. She concluded with evident satisfaction. When they have committed themselves, said Orin, my horsemen and I could ride out and attack them from the rear. They will be so surprised, they will not even have a chance to defend themselves. The tide of battle may... Asawado was replying, when the brazen horn that had announced the arrival of the soldiers sounded once more, so loudly that Aragorn, Arya, and the rest of the elves covered their ears. Aragorn winced with pain from the last. Where is that coming from? Sorrowful willow trees, red as a ruby dipped in blue. 